some performance art. And my work is all about um, using the visual medium to try to communicate ideas of resistance and social justice. So um, most of the, my most recent work is, is images of, of trans people of color engaged in some sort of you know, demonstration of their own identities and really trying to, to interrupt this idea of historic painting where it's just rich sort of white elite people who get put on the canvas and really trying to change that. So in my creative work, like everything that I'm doing is about trying to push forward an agenda of you know, showing the world uh, those of us who aren't always in front of the camera. Um, as an activist, I am very involved in a variety of different organizations in the city that are trying to change this trying to change the city to make it a place that we can all live in and feel safe and secure. So, you know, I'm involved in um, a group called Blackness Yes, and we put on block Arama every year and other things throughout the year. And it's a group that is um, looking at uh, queer and trans liberation from a black uh, African diasporic perspective. So block Arama is one thing that we do. It happens every year at Pride. It's um, a huge stage, it's one of the largest stages at Pride, and it's a space for community members to come together to uh, get connected with resources. We partner with Black Cap, the Black Coalition for AIDS Prevention every year. Um, we actually started Blockarama. Uh, the founders uh, started it in 1999 as a way of disseminating HIV information to Black and African diasporic communities. Um, so we, we still partner with Black Up every year. They, they give out information. Different community groups that provide services to our communities have information tables. So it's a place to come and get connected, but it's also a place to get connected with other human beings and to meet other Black, queer, and trans people. Um, you know, there's many uh, families that come. There's young people. There's, there's people who are seniors in our community. There's elders. So everybody comes together and has a celebration and also uh, makes it a space of resistance at Pride. You know, Pride Toronto is often the place where at the festival a lot of racialized people don't feel uh, that they're represented on most of the other programming and in most of the other stages. So this is a space of resistance that black people are taking up space and um, yeah, and creating a space for themselves and their community. So that's one of the things that we do. We also do um, other things, movement building things throughout the year community picnics, um, you know, information gathering, stuff like that uh, throughout the year. Um, so that's one thing. And then I'm really also very involved in prisoner justice organizing in Toronto. So uh, looking at the experiences of queer and trans people within uh, the Ontario prison system, the Canada Canadian prison system, I, was, I helped to found the Prisoner's Justice Action Committee, which started in 2003, I think. and. Um, it's sort of built out of the work that we were already doing around Prisoner's Justice Day, which is August 10th. Every year, people get together outside of the Don Jail to, to remember and recognize the number of people who have died within the, the prison system and, and the prison industrial complex in Canada. And PJAC was formed to expand and to do things year-round. So one of the things that we initiated was um, a film festival, and the idea was how to try to get the message around prisoners justice and prison abolition to communities of people who might not be familiar with the topic and who may have preconceived ideas about what prisons are and who, who goes to prison and why. Um, you know, the reality is, is the majority of people who are in prison in Canada are in prison related to things uh, related to money, drugs. Um, so things that, you know, dealing with poverty and, and providing adequate harm reduction solutions could actually avoid warehousing people into prisons. So we created this film festival, the Prisoner's Justice Film Festival, and we every year had a focus specifically on queer and trans prisoners. So showcasing films like Cruel and Unusual, which is a film all about trans women, so particularly trans women of color in prison in the United States. Um, one year we did an interview with Laura Whitehorn when she had just been released from prison. She and Marilyn Buck had, uh, they're actually the people who liberated Asada Shakur from prison. And she was serving time, as was Marilyn Buck until she died last year, she was serving time for uh, blowing up the Capitol building in the United States. And she said that she, her and her co-accused maintained that, in fact, they knew what they were doing was illegal, blowing up a building is illegal, but they felt that they were um, 
mandated to do it because of the Geneva Convention. Because if your government is doing something that is directly um, destroying the lives of particular communities, you have a responsibility to take your government to task. And so because of what was happening with systemic racism and systemic um, homophobia within the United States at the time, she felt that they had nothing, they had no other recourse other than to blow up the Capitol building. So she had just been released from prison and was uh, just starting to work at Paws Magazine. She actually became an internet Paws Magazine. And so we did a live interview with her and just trying to bring a prisoner's voices to the forefront to show that people who are in prison are our siblings and our parents and our neighbors and our friends and that in fact um, this idea of who goes to prison is really distorted so that then you know you can kind of vilify prisoners and then justify the prison industrial complex. So that's also part of the work that I've been really involved in doing is trying to shake that up uh, as well. Um, yeah, those are the sort of, and then of course I'm a, a trans activist, so you know, trying to, uh, you know, it's, it's, in a way it was a good experience to come out as trans in the late 90s in Toronto because there really wasn't a lot of support or resources at the time, so we were building things from scratch, uh, and I think that in a way that was a really good experience to have as much as it was really difficult. Um, when the surg our surgeries were delisted in 1998 from OHIP, there was this sort of calling together of people that may have not identified with each other previously, and they came together to try to fight for healthcare. And then through that, we sort of developed this community of people who now were in touch with each other and who were able to push and fight for other things. And so, I mean, that has been a really great experience to be able to be part of that and to learn from some of the other trans activists that were doing a lot of the early work to try to get our search was listed, which we did get, uh, thanks to many people like Susan Gapka and other people like that who were really fighting to um, day in, day out to get that address at the ministry level. But, you know, just being able to be part of that community um, and pushing for other things, I think, has been really great. Mm -hmm. Wow, well, there's a lot there. <laughs> <laughs> share with us experiences, um, be it uh, any of the, the uh, identities that you chose, uh, your artistic work, your activist work, even uh, where you dabble into academic work um, that you had, that you think are significant for how we think about queer liberation um, in terms of theory or practice, the way we think about things, the way we do things. Well, I think, you know, all of the, you know, in, in terms of how my work informs how I think about queer liberation. I think that, you know, all of the areas that I've been really passionate about working within are really areas where we're looking at the people who are the most marginalized within queer organizing. And to me, that's the most interesting and moving part of being involved in this movement is looking at whose voices are not being heard and really trying to work within my own community. So working, uh, you know, black, as a black, queer and trans person, you know, with a disability, like these are parts of my identity that um, I think can be marginalizing and are not necessarily uh, what you would always think of. That's not, a, that's not always the person that you think of when you think of queer people in general. So trying to push for um, changes that affect the most marginalized person has been really interesting to me and that's something that I'm really passionate about. So that's why I'm so interested in prisoners' rights. That's why I'm so interested in harm reduction. That's why I'm so interested in work like with Block Arama and with Blackness Yes, um, and and working with trans activists is because um, you know it's not a coincidence that today queer can be synonymous with white and with men and with you know particular bodies. That's not a coincidence, despite the fact that of course we know that uh, you know, the beginnings of the queer liberation movement was very much started by trans people of color, um, by drug users, by sex workers. Like we were the people who 
were um, at the forefront of the Stonewall riots. We were the people who were fighting back at the Compton Cafeteria riots in 1966. You know, um, and yet as time has gone on, you know, some of those voices have been silenced in order to try to get rights or um, achievements for a limited group of people. And so to me, I think that it's really interesting and important to interrupt that and to try to go back and actually remember what the actual history of our movement is. And so that's, that's the most interesting thing to me. That's very And uh, how would you define your role in the uh, prayer movement? I think um, I, my role in the queer movement well, I guess I wake up in the morning and I'm able to do something, and so then I would do something. And so if that's um, working with a committee of people to try to make something happen, whether it's um, you know speaking at a rally, if it's designing flyers, whatever it takes to do whatever it is that we are working on, that's, that's my role. My role is constantly changing. And I think that as activists, our roles do change, I mean, depending on what needs to be done. Um, I think as an artist, there's a documentation part that is really significant to me. So being able to record um, a moment in history, record the bodies and the people that were doing things, is that's a really amazing opportunity to get to be able to do that. And so as an artist, I don't take that for granted, and I think that that's a really great opportunity to be able to be a documentarian. Um, as an academic, I mean, a lot of my, my research was around trans bodies within academic spaces. So again, sort of documenting and, and sort of bearing witness to something that's happening. Um, but as an activist, I mean, you're, you know, sometimes you're doing really unglamorous things. You're licking stamps and you're, you know, staying up until the middle of the night sewing banners and you're doing things that are exhausting and not necessarily um, your top choice of what job you want to do that day, but there are things that have to be done. So um, I think like in a really practical sense, what is my role, it's really depends on the, the moment. I mean, theoretically, you know, I guess you could sort of in a more abstract way, I think that my, my role is to be a little bit of a pusher, to kind of push us to try to think about, again, just those who are more marginalized within the conversation. But practically, my role is to do what needs to be done that day. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, great. Um, so we've been talking a little bit about um, uh, this concept of uh, queer liberation. How would you define queer liberation? I think, how I would define queer liberation, queer liberation is one piece of a very large puzzle of trying to change uh, or re-remember re um, a world where we can all live in with the right to uh, self-determination and um, where we can all live in a world that is where we feel happy and we feel we have access to the things that we need and want. And so queer liberation is part of something larger, which is this movement towards liberation. So trying to um, imagine societies that are built on social justice, where people really feel true safety and security, where people feel um, that they're part of something. That's like a larger project. That involves addressing a lot of different things, including homophobia, uh, including transphobia, but also things like money and class and um, you know the militarization, industrialization of our societies and you know what's happening to the planet and the environment. I mean, this is part of a larger um, thing that we're all working towards. And queer liberation is an essential part of it, but it's one part of a larger movement. So I think, you know, if, if you try to imagine an endpoint where we sort of have achieved what it is we're working towards, there really isn't an endpoint unless the other things are also achieved. So to me, um, yeah, to me it seems like it's an essential piece of a puzzle that is constantly being put together. And sometimes the puzzle piece gets taken out and then you have to put it back in. And so it's a, it's a work in progress. But, um, and that's why I think that everything, when we talk about intersectionality, why that is so true for me, is because you can't really change something for one community or for one group without changing things for everybody. I mean, there's 
something bigger that we're working on. And um, I think we have to look at it as a bit of a bigger picture. So yeah, this is part of a bigger picture. For just, just briefly, yeah, and, and I think that's a great uh, perspective you're bringing to it. It just, you know, it just has me jumping to what's happening downtown in, in the city right now, and in numerous cities throughout the world, for that matter. Um, the Occupy movement, and, and and sometimes the struggle to understand that very large, broad concept, which I believe a lot of people do understand. Um, maybe it's hard to articulate. I don't know, you obviously. Because <laughs> you're doing so well here, um, but for for others or or even the media to grasp it. Yeah. So. <laughs> um. Yeah, it's amazing to me that you know this. The big thing that has been that I've heard a lot in the media related to Occupy the Occupy movement is why are you here? And I just find that so bizarre because of course anybody who wakes up in the morning and is present in any moment of their day knows why we're trying to change things. And I don't mean we as part of the Occupy Toronto thing, but I mean we as a humanity, people are unhappy um, with a lot of the way that things are being run. And so the 99% could be related to money, but it could be related to anything. You know, there's so often in, mo in so many different examples, there's a 99% and a 1%, and that's in so many different examples. And as long as you have that, you have unrest. And so, of course, people want to change things. And so whether or not, um, and again, one movement can't do that. They, we all have to be working together uh, to make, you know, sort of like, uh, makes me suddenly think of Transformers, where all the pieces have to come together. And then you can make some sort of significant change. And that's what's going to have to happen. But it's really bizarre that it's like, well, why would you come down here? Surely everything's fine, <laughs> when clearly, I mean, in so many different arenas, things are not fine. And it's often money that gets people to start talking about things, but in fact, money is one part, again, of a much larger problem. I mean, I'm very interested in uh, how we get to the places that we're at and uh, what gets remembered and what gets forgotten. I'm, I'm fascinated by that, actually. So to me, that's what, um, that gets represented a lot in my, in my artistic practice and the sort of re-remembering of things. And, you know, my academic work was, was about that as well. When I was doing my master's, I was really interested in this movement towards developing a trans study, so like a field of uh, a study that is specifically looking at the experiences of transsexual and transgender people, while at the same time schools are developing trans policies, and yet trans students are feeling the most excluded and marginalized within that setting. So, you know, whether their name is being called incorrectly at the beginning of the class, you know, from the class list, whether they can or cannot access gyms or showers, and the, like these are things that are happening every single day, while at the same time the university is able to say that it has this flourishing trans studies program and that it's developing these policies. So I was really interested again in what is remembered and what is actually happening. And so to me, um, and then with my, with my interest in activism, I mean, I think a lot about, um, you know, for, for example, 1971, the Black Panther Party um, had a, a pulled a call together for a convention, and it was the, the Revolutionary People's uh, Constitutional Convention or something like that. And the goal of the the meeting was to spend a weekend rewriting the Constitution. And they spent they had uh, representatives from so many different community groups because they were really well outreached, and they drafted a new constitution. And in the new constitution that they drafted in 1971, there is no less than 25 points specifically related to what they called at the time gay liberation. And one of the top three was the right to sex change on demand, free sex change on demand. 
uh, the right to be gay anytime, any place. Like there was a whole list of all of these things that today we're still trying to get. Today we're still trying to fight. And what I was told growing up about the Black Panther Party was that they were really dangerous radicals who were really homophobic. And in fact, you know, in 1971, they were putting forth a new proposition for a constitution that would recognize the rights of children. There was like a whole section on the rights of children that was created by children, that they actually had mentors working with children during the, the writing of the constitution to develop things that worked for them on the rights of women. And again, it's like 25 point platform on, on sort of gay liberation. And to me, that's something that is not remembered. How do we not remember that? How do we not remember that as, and how do we not use that document right now as some of the, th the goals that we're working towards? Because we're, we're fighting for the same thing as a trans person, the right to free sex change on demand. That's a goal that we're still trying to be able to have. Um, and if we had, you know, been able to remember that document from 1971 and just keep pushing it forward, in 2011 we might be in a bit of a different situation. So to me, um, yeah, what gets remembered and what gets forgotten is really surprising. Like again, with you know the Stonewall riot riots and the Compton Cafeteria riots, I mean these were uh, led by like working class street, mostly street involved people. I mean that's who was hanging out in that area. That's who was going to hang out at the bar at the Stonewall Inn. That's that's what was happening there. But yet we have sort of re remembered it to be a riot that was mostly started uh, for other reasons or because people were upset because Judy Garland had died that day. Not that I'm saying that didn't have an impact, but when you think about who was on the front lines, Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson keeping the, the um, they had sort of like a, a picket that they had set up that they kept going for weeks in the rain, standing there in the rain, these two trans women of color. I mean, that's who was sort of keeping this going. And then, you know, very quickly, we get sort of edited out and unremembered from from what from who was actually there or what actually happened. So to me, that's that's very bizarre. And so that's my I can't remember the beginning of the question, but that's my my interest is in re-remembering and trying to uncover what actually has happened because um, it's essential, I think, to be able to move forward. It's a fascinating interest. Um, the, the question uh, was how how do you express that? Right. So it's great that you just shared that. Um, do you make use of those things? Yeah, I think, well, I mean, that's, I mean, part of it is share, being, you know, being a documentarian, so someone who in my artwork communicates that or, or includes parts of those histories in, in the images that I produce. Um, but also, I mean, in, in the activist work that I'm involved in, we talk about these things and we talk about how will this moment be remembered or forgotten and how do we interrupt that? And so one of the things, um, uh, last year was the very first time there was this Queering Black History Month event at Ryerson and Lali Muhammad was one of the people who organized it and during that session there were different people who came together and told these stories about uh, uh, queer black history and trans history um, in Toronto and one of the things that came out of that was this need for an archive that better reflected our stories because of course if you know, Angela Robertson or Courtney McFarlane or, you know, whoever else wasn't there telling that story, you're not going to find that story in the gay and lesbian archives. You're not going to find that story um, in a lot of places within our communities because they've been forgotten or omitted or they just weren't recorded. And so in part of, I guess, part of my goal is for us to have these conversations about how do we actually start to document these things so that then you can have a record. I mean, if somebody hadn't documented that manuscript from the Revolutionary People's Constitutional Convention, that would have been lost as well. I mean, it's kind of already lost because people don't remember it, but at least there's some documentation of the words that were recorded. Um, so we, yeah, that's part of, part of what I think, how we can use those memories is to, to learn from that and then try to make changes in how we're recording our stories today. That's why this is so great, actually, mm -hmm. this project. And it's great having you here sharing this. I'm, I'm running like crazy with some of this stuff. I'm thinking, wow, this is fascinating. So um, and we'll want to track this as well for this. That's, that's great. Um, and indeed, what you just said, I mean, I do remember you being on a panel um, and, and raising some of these more hidden histories that people don't think about. Mine goes to what we're told over and over again. And, and I know there's even some skepticism, some questioning. Does, does history get rewritten? favorite people's different needs or agendas or what have you, and, and as a result, some of the truths get 
marginalized, shoved yeah. and pushed to the margins, and then they're not referred to anymore. You know? Yeah. So, um, okay, that's great. So we'll move to uh, your questions, and you've chosen two under history, and the first being, what can queer liberationists learn by looking at our past? <laughs> okay, well, I, I might have just answered that, but yeah, what, what can queer liberationists learn from looking at our past? I think one of the main things is, um, I mean, humans are, to some extent, creatures of habit. And so, you know, the things that we do, we tend to keep doing over and over again. And so by looking at um, earlier movements and trying to understand what's happened in the past, it really can help us to understand what's happening now. I mean, it sounds like a very cliche thing to say, but, um, you know, to, uh, to try to understand how, um, how we work together, how we don't work together, what happens when you're working in an activist group and things kind of start to fall apart. There's social issues, personal issues that happen. Trying to learn from how other movements have handled that, you know, trying to understand what to do when um, you do sort of get movement happening and things start to change because of course the status quo doesn't always like it when that happens so how do we learn from other movements that have been interrupted by say police brutality or uh, surveillance or things like that how do we learn how to try to avoid some of those things in our future activism i mean that's some of the basic things you get from being able to look at the past there's um the Ashanti people in Ghana, in West Africa, they have, uh, in the Adinkra language, it's like a pictorial language, and one of the things that, one of the symbols is Sankofa, and it's this image of this, well, there's two versions of it, but this one of them is an image of a bird that's turning and looking back at its tail, and it's the importance of learning from your, your, your past and remembering your past, because, of course, you just keep repeating the same mistakes if you don't. Um, and I think that that's, essential for queer liberation is to be able to look back at other movements, particularly movements out of which queer liberation has grown. But as I say, because these things are all connected, really looking at any movement and sort of understanding how is it that human beings were able to work together to try to make something happen? How did it fall apart? What went well? What didn't go well? And then try to use that information to be able to go forward. And also, I think, essentially being able to remember um, Remember what's happened in the places where it's been rewritten, but it hasn't happened, you know? I mean, again, with this uh, document from the Black Panther Party, if you have, uh, you know, this amazing document, we could use that without having to have another convention to rewrite the Constitution. Why do that again if that work has already been done? I mean, there's, obviously, you can update things, but, you know, being able to know what we've done so that we can build on it is also essential. Yeah. And, um your view, in looking at history, what was then known um, in that first wave of um, uh, the movement being identified as gay, and, and then it was called the Gay Liberation Movement, um, did they borrow from other movements? And if, if so, which movements and how? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, my research and you know talking to elders within my community but also doing my own research has definitely suggested that absolutely the gay liberation movement built on earlier movements i mean you look at some of the the strategies um that we were using in the late 1960s or early 1970s and they were definitely built on this other movement that was already happening this movement around civil rights in the united states so i mean i'm speaking in a north american context and I'm particularly speaking, you know, Canada, the United States in a particular time within particular communities. But, you know, we were, we were building on this, this civil rights movement. I mean, that, wasn't hap that was happening at the same time as all these other things are happening. I mean, Martin Luther King Jr. was a champion of gay rights. He was often speaking about gay rights. And as well as, I mean, that's also something that we weren't always told. But he was a champion of gay rights. And he, uh, you know, we were sort of building on that movement, building on the women's liberation movement. I mean, that was essential to a lot of the work that we that ended up coming afterwards. And I mean, again, the trans um, 
trans movement, I mean, this is something where people were individually advocating for their rights, individually advocating for the right to be able to identify how they wanted to identify. You know, starting as early as the late 1800s, I mean, some of the first surgeries that doctors did were, you know, performing on animals to try to understand how to change people's sexes, and that was happening in like 1890. So people were fighting for these things, and then of course this sort of comes together in a cacophony, and then, you know, you start seeing, uh, I guess, bursting out uh, into a more, yeah, into an overt declaration of gay rights in the early 1970s. And so absolutely it was built on that. And I think that, you know, it's interesting how movements kind of connect with each other. I mean, as somebody, um, I have a disability and I'm really interested in sort of the disability rights movement. And, and I was speaking at a conference in, in New York a couple of years ago and a disability studies conference. And while I was speaking at it, somebody who is an elder in our community, she was talking about uh, living in San Francisco in uh, the 1970s, early 1970s, and how she had been involved in this demonstration where they, uh, a whole bunch of people who had mobility uh, disabilities, they had taken over this public building to try to get the state to build, or the city to build wheel cuts so that people could actually get off of the sidewalk, like a basic, basic right. So they had taken over this uh, government building and they were, uh, they ended up being able to occupy it for a significant amount of time. I actually can't remember how many days, but why they were able to occupy it for that length of time was because the Black Panther Party came and brought them food every single day and did attendant care for people every single day and stood outside the building with rifles to stop uh, the police from coming and disrupting the movement every single day. So that's an example of two movements that could not be more different coming together and working together to try to make something happen. And that's what, that's what happened with the queer liberation movement as well. There's all of these examples of times where strange bedfellows, people who were working for very different things, came together, you know, again, to try to make this larger picture happen, uh, to try to make change happen on a larger scale. And, and then you know try to make something happen. And you see that with queer and trans people coming together. You see that with the, the, the women's movement. You see that with uh, the black power movement and, and the gay liberation movement. These are things that came together again and again and again. And then as change starts to happen, you know, there is an active denying of certain parts of our story in order to try to be accepted. And so you see, uh, you know, when the gay liberation Front, that the group that was formed in New York shortly after the Stonewall riots, they start trying to push for this legislation that would protect gay people from being fired um, at their uh, at their job because they were gay, and they actively choose to leave trans off of the agenda, right? So that's happening in 73, 74. You see it happen again in 2007, 2000 with the ENDA, right, where this, re this end discrimination uh, act that was supposed to be passed in the United States and people activists were working for it and they actively chose to leave trans and gender identity off of the agenda in order to try to get the bill to pass. And this idea that if we just kind of push away these alliances and these allegiances we have with these more unsavory parts of our history or our community, then we'll be able to get our rights and then we can try to bring you along afterwards. And that's unfortunately what starts to happen and that's where you see the fracture and the schisms between all of the different communities when in fact, we have always worked together to try to make things happen. And that that actually is our strength and not our weakness. And if we actually push together for certain things, we'd be able to just, I mean, it's not about trying to get individual things for one or two people, it's about changing the entire system so that then we can actually have a place where, again, we all have the right to self-determination. intersect with other social locations and we've got a series of examples um, which you can draw from or, or draw your own for that matter uh, race gender gender identity ethnicity disability class etc mm, I feel like I might have answered that already. you, you yeah. kind of have it's, yeah. it's kind of really been weaved through okay. much of it. I don't want to yeah yeah um, so then there is another one here in the same category what can queer liberationists learn from uh, feminism, critical race theory, 
socialism, disability studies, bisexuality, non-monogamy, and or any other intersectional theoretical framework, and you can choose one or two of those, or any others beyond this that you can come from in your thinking. Um, what is, is it specific about queer liberation theory? Um, yeah, what can queer liberationists learn from right. those other theories? Um, what can queer liberationists learn from? I think that, I mean, essentially what a lot of these other theories, critical race theory, disability studies, trans studies, a lot of these um, theories attempt to document and to, and to try to understand something that's happening within movements within our communities. So, uh, you know, trying to understand how systemic racism works is essentially, it's essential and useful for queer liberationists, right? Because we need to understand how systemic racism can tear apart our communities and actually be detrimental to the thing that we're working towards. We need to understand how um, disability is created as a social, it's a socially created um, model, you know, an understanding that, that instead of this, you know, the system and the society that doesn't build, or build for or anticipate uh, the, the variety of human bodies and minds that, that exist in humanity. The problem is, that's the problem. The, the body and the person isn't the problem. You know, so trying to understand, uh, you know, the social model of disability, trying to understand how critical race theory works and how we are, you know, playing out um, this idea of race-based thinking within our communities every single day, that's useful, it's, it's absolutely useful because it means that, um, we could hopefully try to interrupt it and try to make some different choices. I mean, it's interesting how um, this interaction between things that are actually happening on the ground within our communities and then theory and people who are writing about what's happening on the ground and that doesn't always, it's not, there's not always a direct translation and it's not always a, an accurate uh, understanding of what's happening and things change so quickly in both of those arenas. Um, so how much can uh, queer liberation activism learn from theory? I don't know. I mean, yeah, you know, it's interesting to be able to have the opportunity. I remember when I went to go do uh, grad work, I can remember uh, one of the professors who I had gone to, to meet with just to get information before I started. She said, you know, this can be a really great place to come and, and sort of think about and understand the activism that you're already doing within your community. And I was really excited about that opportunity, but I'm not sure that that's in practice what actually happens. And I, I would like to think that we could be able to do that, but I don't know if I was able to do that because to me those worlds were really, really different. Um, I think that there can be a lot of tension between activists and academics and that can happen you know, uh, in a lot of different fields. So how much can queer liberation activism learn from theory? I don't know. But I think that, you know, in, in you know, I guess essentially the tenets of the theory, you know, the, the things that, that we're trying to say, you know, by talking about, you know, anti-colonial work or whatever it is that we're writing about, you know, that's useful. It's useful information. Now, how to, how to work with academics to communicate that in a way that other human beings can understand, that's a whole different story. But uh, I think it's useful. It's, it's really fascinating um, because uh, you clearly locate uh, liberation in, in an activist realm. You see it as an on-the-ground, on um, task-oriented, kind of actionable um, yeah. thing that happens. Um, so it just that's what's coming through from this, and it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, as, as compared, for example, which is not your Yeah, and I, you know, there's a, there was a, an anthology that was put forward called Black Black Queer Studies, I think, or Black Queer, Black Queer Studies, I think, 
and it's an anthology of academic writing about black queer theory and why black queer theory and what, what does it mean to have it to have another section of queer theory, black queer theory, what does that mean is addressed within the book. But in the introduction, I can remember um, uh, the person who was writing the introduction was talking about being at a conference where once again, it kind of turned into this pitted fight between academics and activists and how that just happens, can happen over and over again. And I think that some of the tension comes from the perception that, that uh, you know, people who are doing the work on the ground are having uh, those sort of stories taken and, 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 and told not from their own voices. Uh, you know, people making, literally making careers on writing about the work of, of, of people who are doing it um, on the, sort of on the ground for, for volunteer, you know. Um, but I think it also can be, there's just a miscommunication. There can be a lot of miscommunication. So this idea that, uh, theory is devoid from practice and practice is devoid from theory when in fact a lot of the time it's the same people doing it. I mean, that's one of the nice things about right now is that there's more and more activists getting into grad school and more and more grad students getting involved in organizing within their communities. But uh, yeah, that tension is so often there. Yeah, you're so right. Um, and, and it's interesting because uh, that latter point you just made is because And that's what's so interesting to me about trans studies is this, you know, is that that field of study seems very much to come from and by trans people themselves who have for 10 or 15 years been sometimes uh, out of necessity making a living on doing these trans 101s and doing all of this sort of trans theory and education of other queer community members in order to be able to be in this group, I guess I'm going to have to explain to you my story or, you know, doing it in so in some of the agencies that we have to go to for services. Like there's this phenomenon of us having to be re over and over again teaching about trans history in order to be able to then uh, be able to access uh, programs and services. And so, you know, I to me, a lot of trans, um, the trans studies that I've read, it seems to be coming out of this, you know, for example, you know, Vivian Namaste uh, writing with Mira Saleh Ross about uh, HIV prevention and trying, and, and, and trying to be able to access women's shelters and, and HIV um, and ASOs. Okay, so once again, we're trying to access something and we're having to develop this theory and education around uh, being able to access basic, basic things that, that are being offered in our community. And, um, yeah, so it's interesting with trans studies is that very much it seems to be coming, and I mean, it's a new field of study, so I'm sure that could change. But right now it seems very much like it's coming out of these personal interests and personal stories. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I, I just want to flip this a little bit as well. We were talking a lot about, um, in the discussion around, say, the, the, the role of responsibility on the part of academia to be a bit more respectful. Dying off of that, you know. Um, something that occurs to me, and I'm just curious if you've had this experience, and if you were say you're involved in um, at the activist level, even at the, the artistic level, um, the responsibility there to not just do but think about what you're doing and be driven or um, guided by a certain set of principles. Um, so I'll just share a really quick. I'm going to get it out anyway, 
Yeah. yeah. Um, sharing examples very quickly in that at um, one of the criticisms that we're getting at Crown Territory, just as right. an example, um, is um, that sometimes we come across as a bunch of uh, academics. Right. And that if, if people do read our stuff on our website or we put out a statement or something, um, people will say, you know, they're into the, all those big words and to all that analysis and we may be alienating people in that process, right? And so that causes us within Queer Ontario to have our own battles, not that serious battles, but, but our struggles around what language are we using and how do we get this across? And some people are saying we have to be accessible, you know, that's, that's a principle we have to, to, to you know, uh, abide by. And others are saying, I resent dumbing things down, you know, yeah. so it, it gets into this, you know? <laughs> Um, and so I'm just wondering, from your experience, be it um, Black and CS or in your artistic movements or whatever, yeah. any sense of responsibility that it's not just about having to, you know, sew in the middle of the night in a vendor yeah. or what have you, but also think about what you're doing before you do it and how do we... Absolutely. I mean, the the needing to think about what we're doing and why we're doing it is, is that's a huge part of it. And that's actually sometimes where we get into, you, you can kind of get into trouble is, this balance between doing and, and theory and that can be a make or break it for a lot of people about whether or not they want to stay or leave, you know, in terms of a group. I know with, you know, with Blackness Yes, for example, um, when all of this stuff was happening with Pride Toronto related to quiet, queers against Israeli apartheid, uh, it was, uh, when it really blew up, I mean, it had been simmering on a low boil for a while, but when it really blew up, was at the same time that Black Yes was told that we were once again being moved, and this time to an even worse location than we had already been moved to. And so, you know, it was this moment where it really showed how out of touch Pride Toronto was with the community. And we had this community forum. We had a series of community forums talking about what was happening and trying to get community input and feedback and just kind of mobilize people around you know, not wanting to move and, you know, one of the things that happened in that meeting, in that first meeting we had, was that we were offered um, a variety of riches if we would speak out against Squaya and if we were willing to take space away from yet another group. So we could bump the youth, uh, queer youth group out and take their space. Um, and, the, you know, that was one off offer that was given to us. Um, and then we were contacted later on by one of the main funders of Pride and they said, we'll really push for you to get a great space if you'll say something against Quiet. So we had this, um, you, know, the, you know, this just sort of a really bizarre, and of course we were never ever going to take a space that meant pushing another group out. And we were definitely not gonna speak out against Quiet because we believe in the right to self-determination for all people and the liberation of Palestine and the liberation of Turtle Island. And that was like full in the forefront of what Blackness Yes stood for. But this idea that we had to sort of come up with, well, suddenly we were having to come up with these beautiful theoretical statements to, to, to respond to, uh, you know, in the media and also to these particular people who were offering us these things. And that was something that not all of us had done before. And we really had to work at being very specific about what it was we were saying, why we were saying it, how we were saying it. Um, I mean, that was a, a really essential a essential moment for us, I think, because I mean, not everybody has experience doing that, not everybody wants to do that, but it was something that was really important. And then, you know, as the debacle kind of grew and more and more groups got involved in trying to address this issue between pride and, and quiet, uh, I can remember going to a meeting where we came as participants. We came to hear what was going to happen, and we weren't running the meeting, we weren't leading the meeting. And when we were asked to speak uh, on behalf of Blackness Yes, I was like, I, I don't have anything prepared. I'm not prepared to speak. We came just as uh, participants, not as representatives of Blackness Yes. And uh, somebody in the room actually got up and went on the microphone and called us out and said, how come Blackness Yes isn't here? How come you're not Commute, you're not participating in this conversation about what's happening with quiet. And so we had to get up and say something, and we did. But, you know, it was just this moment where, um, 
yeah, you really had to have the words to be able to explain why we were doing what we were doing and what we believed in. Uh, whether we were exhausted that day and didn't really feel like speaking on behalf of a whole group of people or not, you just we had to be able to be on the ball to do that. And I mean, with prisoners justice organizing, and that's happened as well. I mean, when we were working on trying to figure out what our next strategy was when PJAC was just starting, you know, we a lot of the people in the group were um, longtime prisoners' rights activists. Some people who had been working for twenty years, but who some of whom were also professors or or were going to grad school, and so there was this push and pull between developing a film festival, which would reach sort of a broad array of people, and developing um, like a, I don't know what else, how to, like a campaign, basically where you would be doing like uh, sort of talks and lectures and things like that directly about prisoners' rights and and come up with a particular thing that we were going to focus on and that was what we were going to do. And we had this real pull between, okay, well, what are we actually going to focus on? What's going to reach the most number of people? And in the end, um, and at the same time, you know, who are we to be making this decision? Because it's prisoners who are the most affected, so shouldn't they get to, to choose what it is that we focus on? And, you know, you don't want to assume or, or in any way suggest that people in prison aren't going to be able to understand academic speak because that's absolutely not true, nor can you say that they're going to feel more welcome at a film festival because that's also not absolutely not true. So, you know, we, we regularly had to come up against this push and pull of how to communicate and, you know, how do we communicate in a way that specifically is by and for the people who are working for it, which is prisoners themselves. So that's an ongoing issue, <laughs> absolutely. So we're all struggling with that. Yeah. Um, we come to your last uh, chosen question, and that's under today and tomorrow. Uh, are there aspects of critical liberation that you consider to be detrimental or a disservice to the movement? Yes. Are there aspects of critical liberation that I feel are a disservice or detrimental to the movement? Um, I think the biggest disservice we do to ourselves is when we pretend, uh, when we deny our own history. I think that's the biggest disservice that we do to ourselves and it is detrimental in the long run. So I was interviewed um, about uh, a year and a half ago about something to do with, with queer and trans history and uh, when I was, uh, I did my talk and I was talking about Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, who are clearly personal heroes for me. And I was talking about their work with the Stonewall Riots. And I was talking about, um, you know, Sylvia Rivera has often talked about how it was mostly drug users who would go to, uh, and hustlers, as she would call it, who would go and hang out at the Stonewall Inn. And that that's sort of who got caught up in this melee. They were people who were regularly used to being arrested. It was also a lot of cross-dressers and street queens, as she called them at the time, who were uh, regularly being arrested because if the police came and raided the bar that the thing that they could kind of hold people on was wearing the wrong clothes so that's who was sort of regularly being arrested and that's who was caught up in this melee and who just said enough I'm not being arrested again tonight this is not happening um, and so I mean there's like first-hand accounts that this is in fact what happened you know and I was talking about that and I was talking about how the first Gay Pride March in New York in 1970 or 1971, whatever it was, was funded by an independently wealthy trans woman who gave all the money to be able to uh, make the banners, close the street, that the, all the things they did, and how this is just not part of what's recorded. And afterwards, the interviewer said, once the interview was done, he said, that's just not true, though, eh? It's just not true. Like, it was mostly, like, it's because of Judy Garland. It's because Judy Garland died, and everybody was really upset, and I think they've disproved that. And I was like, who's disproved that? And he said, no, they've disproved it. It wasn't trans people at the beginning. It wasn't. They, they didn't really come around until much later. They, they've proven that. And so just this idea that you can just say, oh, they've disproven it, and then, when, and then that means it's true, is something that happens over and over again. Oh, the Black Panther Party was really homophobic. Point. Well, no, actually, that's not true. And in fact, Huey Newton, the leader of the Black Panther Party, he himself had gay experiences when he was in prison and he wrote about it and he talked about it and you know they wrote 
they had organized a, a, a meeting to rewrite the Constitution where they specifically asked for the right to sex change on the man and the right to be gay any time, any place. And these are part of the things that they were fighting for in 1971. But you can just say, no, I don't think that's true. And then we just sort of, okay, well then I guess we just will forget that and we'll just throw it out. Um, it, so even as we're starting to re-remember what's happened, you can just say, oh, I don't think that's true. And then, and then we just go on to believe in what we've, already, what we've already been told. And I think that that's a huge detriment to, to our movement because without being able to um, see the connections that have always been there, then you don't have to have a black queer studies, you know, because queer studies is inherently a, a talking about black people as well as disabled people, as well as trans people. So you don't have to create all of these mushrooming you know, separate movements just in order for all the voices to be included. You can create a queer, queer liberation movement that has always been about all of us. Um, to me, that's like essential because it has always been about all of us. And then, you know, things kind of, we've, some of us have been edited out in recent years, but it has always been about all of us because we were involved from the very beginning. And I think that that's essential for us to remember and a huge disservice when we actively forget that. Great, that was wonderful. So the last required question is um, that we ask everyone is, this, is whether there's anything further that you want to add, any, um, uh, anything that, uh, given the kind of conversation we had, anything that you didn't get a chance to uh, say? I'm a big talker, I think I said, <laughs> I think I said everything, I'm gonna go on and on. That's yeah. great. I appreciate that. You you really have given quite an outstanding interview. Oh, great. And I have all these visualizations in my head. Oh, great. <laughs> all these things that I think, oh my god, this is, this is so rich. Great. I think we didn't really um, touch upon is this is the pretty much the first time that we've had football kind of artistic right. For sure, I can send you some. I have JPEGs on a lot of my artists. Wonderful, wonderful. This will be artistic piece as well, not just. That's great. Yeah, we're worried about the talking head effect to me. You know, yeah. We have a lot of people we've interviewed, and we don't want one head after another after another. Yeah. We want to be able to make it interesting to look at and just get people's minds going and stuff. So. Great. When you mention things, it's really nice to be able to see that. Great. Yeah. <coughs> great. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So, just because I'm Karen, and as soon as I get home, I'll be in baby mode. If you could just, if I don't send you something, could you oh, just send fine. me a reminder? Because oh, yeah. well, otherwise... We, yeah, when we go into post-production, we're going to okay. be triggered by it. When we review everything, and we'll get back and touch with everyone. Can we, can we use it? Just great. Right. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Once, once, it's just like you get swallowed up into this other world of diapers and yeah. has she eaten yet and the next thing you know it's Tuesday and like yeah. two days have gone by and you don't even know but yeah. it's amazing. Right. Great. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah.